Hello, everybody. It is April 29th, 2024, and we are in the heart of earnings season. So I thought I'd go through a couple of things on earnings, bringing back the stocks of the week article. So we'll go through this first one and then um, take a look at a couple of options that you might want to write. All right. First off, stocks of the week. Going to start doing this every week. Right now, we uh, get a little earnings update. So earnings season is in full swing. The scorecard, and this is from Fact Set Earnings Insight, which you should all be able to get to on your own, but I have a link here. Uh, for the first quarter, with about 46% of the companies already reporting in the S&P 500, 77% of companies have reported a positive EPS surprise, and 60% of the S&P 500 companies have reported a positive revenue surprise. Now, the initial thought is, woo, lots of beats. Here's the problem. Neither one of those numbers is special historically. In fact, they are almost exactly average for the last 10 years. And why is that? It is because the analysts change their forecasts pretty much every quarter. So they usually only have to be kind of on it for three months out. When you take a look at their year-over-year -year forecasts, they're a little bit worse. But, you know, they're not very long-term forecasts. They're pretty much in real time. They're not really telling you anything. This is why the analysts are so bad at their jobs, is they're not looking forward more than a year. It's, it's just junk information that a lot of them give you. It's regurgitation. It's them reading the financial statement and saying, this is what it says. Hey, great. I can read too. So there's nothing special about the earnings scorecard right now, even though people woo -woo -woo -woo, cheer and cheer and cheer over the fact that these companies have beaten what are generally lowered expectations, right? So the companies set the bar low, so it's easy for them to get over. This is a junk number. You should ignore it. It doesn't mean shit. Doesn't mean shit from shine. Doesn't mean shit from shinola. There, all the different types of shit. And yet people pay attention to it. The only time this really matters is when it's way above average or way below average. And usually that's a lagging indicator and the market has already responded to it. So who cares? You can see the full report here. It is about 36 pages, I believe. And I've pretty much gone through it over the weekend. Earnings growth rate. Look at that. Pretty much average. And if you go over to the New York uh, School of Business at, at Stern, NYU Stern, uh, they show you some interesting things historically. So way back when... Payout ratio of dividends was up in the 50s. We're all the way down to about 32%. So of the companies that are paying a dividend, they're paying out a smaller percentage of their earnings and dividends. And you can see that the dividend yield has gone way down. And that's a function of two things. One, prices are high right now, as we'll get to in a second. And they're paying out less in dividends and they're doing more buybacks instead. So the government, at least certain people in the government, Elizabeth Warren, bitch and moan about, hey, they shouldn't be buying shares back. They should be investing back into their companies. Well, Elizabeth, why don't you run a company and tell them how to do it? I, I don't think that she understands what a buyback does. A buyback recycles capital and puts it back in the system. Now, that company is not reinvesting the money, but because people are getting paid out that money, because the shares get bought back, that is good for the capital structure of that company, which keeps them healthy. And that money gets into the broader economy for reinvestment somewhere else. So the idea of villainizing buybacks is just economically ignorant. And it's a populist thing that people like to yell and scream about because they can't take one minute to explain things to the po population. Because, oh my gosh, if I have to explain something to them, they might get offended that I'm explaining it to them because I'm telling them they're dumb and they won't vote for me anymore. Whatever. I, I, I'm pretty tired of politicians on both sides, you know, with the, with the soundbite uh, narratives that they put out there. Buybacks are good so long as they're not designed to only enrich the executives, which obviously in many cases they have been. But it wouldn't work that way if executives got taxed based on their income rather than the imaginary capital gains tax that they get. You know, that that's important because it affects you as a shareholder. And if executives can rig the system in their favor, 
It's just them taking more money out of your pocket as a shareholder. Elon Musk is trying to do it. So when you go to the earnings growth over the last decade, earnings growth has been about 7%. It was three and a half. Now that's kind of important, isn't it? Hmm. Earnings growth is only about half of what it's been the last decade. And when we take a look at the earnings revisions, again, only about 3.4% upside is being forecast. That's below average. And the earnings guidance as well has been pretty much neutral. So what we are seeing is that almost all of the gains in the stock market since it bottomed at the end of 2022 has come in the form of valuation expansion. There really hasn't been a lot of big earnings. And I'm talking about the S&P 500 here. You really haven't seen earnings go up much. Just showed it on one of these charts. I think this one. Look, earnings in 2022 were $219 a share. 2023, $219 a share. And I think they're going to come in at about, you know, 3%. Three and a half percent more than that. That's what they're forecasting. So whatever that is, you know, 230-ish. So the valuation ratio for the S&P 500 forward PE is 20. That is above the five-year average of 19 and 10-year average of 7. Now the historical average is way down at like 15 and a half, 16. I don't think we ever get back down to there except on recessions because the capital structure has just changed. So we should expect higher valuation ratios compared to 30 years ago today. It's just enough of the system has changed to support that idea. Now, should it be 30% more like it is right now, right? 20 instead of 15, 20 ish instead of 15 ish? Probably not. Could it be 16 and a half or even maybe 18? Yeah, probably. I think that those upper teens numbers are viable, especially in the parts of the economy that grow. Now, in the industries where they don't show a lot of growth, where the growth is single digit, the PE should be lower. It should be a 10 or a 12. And yet we have a lot of capital intensive companies without huge margins getting PEs of 15, 20, 25, 30. At some point, there's not enough liquidity to hold those stock prices up. And one of the big events coming for a lot of large caps is that pensions are basically at net neutral right now. They have about as much coming in as they have going out. Next year and the year after, that changes to more coming out than going in as more baby boomers retire. And of course, most Xers and millennials and Gen Z don't have a pension. So the pension funds, which are primarily in bonds and large cap stocks, are going to become net sellers of large cap stocks and of US debt. So we're going to go from a position of everybody wanting American debt, foreign and domestic, to fewer people internationally wanting as much foreign uh, U.S. debt. They'll still want some, but just take a look at China and Japan. They want less, and Japan's an ally, and the pensions are going to be selling some of it too. So as I talked about a couple of months ago, the Treasury needs two things. They need the banks to get back into the debt market, and they need interest rates to be lower. Unfortunately, those two things push back on each other. So the only way to get the banks into the U.S. Treasury market is to write the rules in a way that on their balance sheet, it's debt-free. Excuse me, that on their balance sheet, it's a no-risk asset that doesn't have to be marked to market. So until we have a, a financial crisis, you really can't do QE and send interest rates down to below 2% again. Otherwise, the people who are buying the debt now don't want it because the interest rate will be too low. It also means that by about 2030, in the face of the last baby boomer being on Medicare, which happens in 2930, we have to figure out a way of moving towards a balanced budget by the 2030, or we're in big trouble. Jamie Dimon said about 10 years out, there's a financial crisis setting up. I think it's about five years out. So we do, in fact, have to get closer to balancing the budget. 80% of the deficit is from tax cuts that occurred under George W. Bush and Donald Trump, and 80% go to the wealthiest 1% of the people. I think that's your low-hanging fruit because you try putting Social Security or Medicare or defense. Those three things make up 90% of the budget outside of interest, which is now like 15 16%, too damn high. It all trickles back into the stock market because where does the capital come from? Where is it right now? Corporations are sitting on more cash right now, even though they do also have a ton of debt across about half the companies in the S&P 500. And the numbers that you're looking at today should be a warning that large cap stocks have a pretty bad time coming in general, not all of them, 
coming sometime in the next five to ten years. And the market typically sniffs that out way ahead of time. It's so while Jamie Dimon is saying and, and Ray Dalio and probably 50 other guys like to roll off are saying, hey, about 10 years out, there's a financial crisis coming. I, I do think it's closer to about five years out. The stock market has the inflation narrative wrong, but they're sniffing around. I have an article coming out today on Seeking Alpha. You can see it in Margin of Safety right now. And ultimately, you'll get it on Fundamental Trends because I'll have to link it back to Seeking Alpha because it is content uh, exclusive to them. Although I will put a chart book up on Fundamental Trends from time to time that basically covers I did that last. So when you take a look at these numbers, you really have to think, well, what do they really mean? Valuation is a key issue. So if the stock market goes from a PE ratio of 20 down to 18, that's a 10% correction. 16 20% correct, right? I continue to see the best growth and valuations in the small cap space. Eventually that will play out. I was just on X twit and some kid, you know, some 30 year old with $66,000 who um, is talking about investing said, Hey, the longer I do this, the more I just think everybody should index. And so I read him the riot act. I don't know if he's responded or not. And I just see a whole another generation of disaffected investors who try to find shortcuts either through trading too much or through index. And it's kind of mind boggling to me that folks just don't follow along with what Warren Buffett has been talking about for 50 years, which is learn the companies that you're invested in and invest in them. And granted, he has lately said by the S&P 500, mainly because he thinks you're all shitty investors. But the problem with just buying the S&P 500 for 80 or 90% of your money is that's not real diversification because it's only one asset class. It's large cap stock. Where's the mid caps? Where's the small caps? Where's the emerging markets? Where's the international debt? Where's the private equity? You don't see endowments managing their money like that. And they crush the market. So indexing the large caps for maybe half your money I get, you can't really index more than that. Not the large caps anyway. And all of the other markets are less efficient, so indexes don't work there, right? Indexes work in efficient markets, not in inefficient markets. If you don't understand that, look it up. In markets that have less information going to the public or available to the public or known to the public, it's really all available. People just don't do the reading. You can get an edge by doing the reading. But in the large cap space, with half the people indexing, and having no idea what they're invested in, that actually becomes an efficient market that just moves with the ebbs and flow of liquidity. And the number one thing to follow to know what liquidity is, is what? One word. And there is a second answer that is second best, which I think you'll all say. But what is the one thing to follow to know how much money is going into the stock market? Number one thing. No, no, no. What is the factor? What is the thing that you have to pay attention to? We've talked about it a thousand times. What is the number one harbinger of future money going into the stock market? If the unemployment rate rises, the amount of money that goes into the stock market will decrease, right? It's the reduction in liquidity. Now, the second best answer that nobody said, and there's a meeting this week, is the Fed because they, you know, they monkey around with the system. So between employment and the Fed, those are the two major levers on liquidity. And because the Fed and the federal government during the bailouts of COVID, did you read the article last night, created so much money during COVID, there's an overhang of excess liquidity that they've been trying to whittle down to neutral. And you ever go, oh! They printed too much money. Oh, and the Fed. I should have had the camera on today. I'm very entertaining right now. No, it was reasonable to do those bailouts because we didn't know what COVID was going to turn into. What if COVID had stretched on for two years and hardly anybody was working? If we were just doing essential work for two years, what if it had been more deadly? They didn't know at the time. Nobody knew. Anybody who says they knew, oh, it was just a flu I knew all along. Go fuck yourself. You had no idea. I was talking to bioengineers and the dude who is number two in the Mexican healthcare system when they had SARS or something. Nobody knew. Best people in the world didn't know. You didn't know. I didn't know. The Fed didn't know. Even the Congress people didn't know. So what did they do? They printed a whole bunch of money. They did a whole bunch of bailouts. One, because, hey, 
never let a good crisis go to waste. But but really, mostly because what if it had been worse? So now this excess liquidity overhang is actually almost gone. Most of that money is in private hands. And you have to have the regulations and the taxes set up in a way that forces that money back into the system to build the stuff that we need or for the services that we need, rather than allowing it to sit in big piles guarded by dragons who just want to skim the equities and bond and commodities market. Read Robert Reich, what he's been saying about this the last year. There needs to be a major recycling of money in this economy, or we're going to see a crash of epic proportions that might come along with something worse than the Great Recession. I don't think that we have the capacity to have a Great Depression again, but it could get as bad as 2008, 9, 10, no doubt. And you know my feelings on that. Coin flip, it happens under Biden. Certainty, it happens under Trump. I have kept my nose clean in my 20s. I'd be running for that off. I'd be so sick of the morons that are out there. My ethics are special. I do believe in the greater good, and I would have been willing to sacrifice some people to get it. So this stock market, even though I think it's going up for a while, getting risky. The ratios are out of line. We haven't gotten the AI dividend yet, right? The, the wider margins, and shorter work weeks, that hasn't happened yet. It's going to take a long time. It's not going to be two years. It's going to be 10 to 20. We haven't gotten the clean energy dividend yet, although kind of we have, or we're just starting to see it, which is why I pointed out that Clearway and Brookfield Renewable Energy are probably great investments because now, even though they have lots of CapEx yet to do, the CapEx that they spent is generating pretty high margin revenue for utility businesses. That's why I love Marathon Digital, all that clean energy, over a gigawatt of clean energy they have. The margins are really good, especially when you have a bankroll of Bitcoin that just keeps going up. Oh, but it's down this last week. Yeah, buy it. Have you not seen some of the stuff that Les has posted in the chat? All the rich people are adopting it. They have a conference in Dubai. The internationalization of Bitcoin is here. It's happening. It's real. Countries, companies, rich people, criminal, early adopters. You better have some. So the companies, Google. They beat handily on the cloud growth related to AI. I expect that to continue. They are one of the three big cloud providers, along with Microsoft and Amazon. They're oligopolists in that space. I think they have like 80% between, uh, of the cloud between those three companies. The thing people aren't quite valuing yet with Google is YouTube. For the life of me, I don't understand why YouTube or Apple aren't buying Paramount. I think the alphabet would be smart to spin YouTube off and then absorb and then buy buy Paramount. I mean, they could they'd still be you know they'd still be paying Google for the ad service technology. So it's no skin off Google's back. But in order to get through antitrust, they'd have to spin YouTube off. I don't know why they don't do it. Snap is a company that I just added. We'll get to that in a second. But I think that they're a potential big winner if TikTok gets a big ding. Exxon they missed Q1 earnings. The story is the same there with all the other heavy capex companies margins just don't have anywhere to go but sideways or down guyana is a legitimate home run without guyana exxon would have been in big trouble the investment the uh the inflation reduction act good for big oil because of the carbon capture but that stuff just offsets a declining secular trend on a big heavy company that'll never be able to get a rip away from the capex so i'm willing to own exxon in the spider energy ETF, but I don't want to own it individual. Microsoft, they also had a big earnings beat, again, due to AI deployment to the cloud. But they have a forward P of 34, and the growth rate is only in the teens. It's pretty much priced efficiently right now. I don't need to own it individually. I can own it through QQQ because you get a basket of companies like it. Don't have to worry about it. There's nothing special about owning Microsoft here because of the three big cloud companies, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Amazon reports tomorrow, I think. It's this week sometime. They don't really have anything to spin off. Microsoft is Microsoft. Maybe they would spin off a healthcare company, you know, just contract with them for technology. You know, maybe they'd be one to buy Teladoc or something. I mean, that's the one that we all thought. You know, that industry got saturated really quick. Now that I'm older and actually use the healthcare system, I see how it's working. I talk to the doctors. How does how do you do that? Went to a dermatologist. The doctor just talks. The assistant types it in. Boom, it gets populated to their whole network. 
everything's on a backbone of Epic out in Madison, Wisconsin. That's a company that you got a kid in the Madison, Wisconsin area or anywhere that Epic operates, that's a company to get into. Because if they ever go public, it'll instantly, instantly, instantly be a $100 billion company on the S&P 500. And it might be worth more to that. I have no idea. I hope the CEO of that company, I hope she uh, buys the brewers because she's stubborn. She's a no-nonsense, no no-bullshit person, right? Then that means that means guys call her a bitch. But <laughs> she's awesome. I'd love for her to buy the brewers. They would never leave. Netflix, and I'm going to write a whole article on it, but Netflix's earnings, and in particular their subscriber numbers, are getting harder. Growth is getting harder at Netflix. In order for them to continue growing subscriber numbers, they have to expand internationally. And they have a great strategy for it. There's a mini documentary on Bloomberg right now on the app that by providing some local content, which means studios all over the world, which means a lot of CapEx, they can expand internationally. And I do think Netflix becomes the biggest company out there in media. Paramount's, you know, Paramount should be on their radar too. Just doesn't make any sense to me why Paramount isn't merging with somebody that doesn't have a news division in sports, right? I mean, Paramount would be a perfect pairing for Netflix. And that rumor has been out there. The problem with Netflix is that it's been a meme stock. It's rallied a lot, priced for perfection. And as we know, perfection is impossible. Somebody says uh, Judy over at uh, Epic will never go public. Her stock is in a trust for the benefit of the user. Is that true? I didn't know that. Well, but she's got to be a, a billionaire, so... You know, let her buy the brewers or let her trust buy the brewers. I don't care. Just keep the brewers in town until I'm dead. Um, Snap. This is the one that I just added. Is she over 75 now? Wow. Man, she's been, uh, what is her last name? Judith Faulkner. Look her up. Spectacular career. Spectacular. She is, she doesn't get the press that like a Jack Welch got. She's a better CEO than he was. Now, granted, to me, that's not setting the bar very high. I know that people idolize the dude because he said the right things to half the people, but you know he also destroyed GE to the point where it's just recovering 20 years later. Judith Faulkner is one of the best business people in the history of America. She is. I don't know if you call it a top 100 or a top 200, right? You do like an NBA all-star thing. She's amazing. But, you know, guys call her names because, you know, she's a woman. All right. Anyway, Snap. Snap is a favorite of Gen Z and the millennials. And... I don't use it because I, I just I just don't use a lot of social media. It's probably been to my detriment, at least business wise. And it can be a super winner. It just it's just going profitable. It's about a twenty billion dollar company, which means it's probably going to get in the S and P five hundred in the next year or two. But if TikTok really gets dinked, if they pull out of America because the law says they can't be on iPhones or Android system phones, right? If they if they get you know gotten rid of the three big winners are Snap, Instagram, which is Facebook, and YouTube Shorts. I think Snap and YouTube Shorts are the big winners, although, you know, everybody loves Instagram because Zuckerberg has been just smart enough to not completely irritate the user. I mean, he's, he's toyed with irritating the users, and people have reined him in. So we'll see. Zuckerberg doing some interesting things with his life all of a sudden, you know, over the last several years. And I don't know. Maybe he's just doing cool things because he made a lot of money stealing the company from a couple of twins. Who knows? Anyway, Snap is going to be on the very short list uh, today, and I'm going to add it to the punch card growth stocks in maybe ahead of July. We'll see. I want to I want to keep an eye on TikTok. I think the Snap story really takes off if TikTok disappears. We'll see. I'm not positive TikTok is disappearing. The parent company said they're not going to sell it. So I, I don't know. They, it's a law. It's a law that they can't own it. So I don't know how they get around what Congress just did. I, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, people want to say that it's a free speech stuff, you know, free speech issue. It's not. It has nothing to do with free speech. It has to do with every TikTok user now has a profile that the Chinese government has, right? Rather than just Google and the, you know, NSA having it. Come on. All right, last one I'm going to cover today is Tesla. And I got five others or six others to add to this, and then I'll publish it. Uh, in, for, in order to get investors to not focus on the problems with their EVs, company is like, man, this is another one I should be on camera, I guess. Just pointing everywhere. Here, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. We're an AI company now. We're a robot, robo-taxi company now. 
hey, we can sell full self-driving that's not really full self-driving in China now. Don't pay attention to the falling EV sales, the falling margins, or the fact that I'm laying off 10% of my workforce so that I can get 12% in stock bonus. Actually, 12% of the whole company is a, is a bonus. Right? Remember, Musk sold like 40% of his stockholders. He wants the company just to give it back to him. He said, otherwise, he'll go somewhere else. He'll do other things. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty much there. I'm not a shareholder of Tesla anymore, right? I started shorting it a couple of years ago. I'm not short now. Last week on, on Stocks on Spaces on Wolf Financial on uh, XTwit, <laughs> Musk's own network, I said I was short most of the last two years. And it's a super risky trade, so I didn't, you know, that's not one of the ones that I would do at margin of safety. But I closed my short position right before options expired. And now Tesla is up, what, 25, 30% in a week? Smoke and mirrors, folks. It is the Ringling Brothers Circus. Look at what's in ring number two. The flying elephant, right? Don't look at the hoist over on the side. I think that Tesla, when this rally is over, is in pretty big trouble. Because the robo-taxi is not going to happen this year. They're not going to have the cheaper cars this year. Full self-driving is not going to happen this decade. He's just going to have to wait for broader EV adoption like everybody else a few years out. So you've got the fanboys and the cheerleaders out there. Rah, rah, rah. Let's chase this thing up. Try to suck in some stupid retail. Stock's going to go back down. It's 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 going to break through the double bottom it just did. I would say that Tesla's probably headed to around 100 bucks a share. I could be wrong, but tell me when I've been wrong about Tesla. We bought it several years ago, a couple times, sold it right at the top, and then I shorted it. And I'm actually a half a dozen of you shorted it with me. So I mentioned it the one time on fundamental trends. But shorting isn't for most people, and it's a hard trade. And I did it exclusively with options, though. In any case, jump over to our handy-dandy trading view. This is the S&P 500 and the weekly RSI. All these companies, you know, Chipotle, Mexican Grill in particular. Anything without a buy in the OS rating, the oscillator rating, is to me a sell or a right of cover call. So Chipotle, GE Aerospace, Republic Services, you know, that's Waste, Targa, Xylem. I mean, Freeport MacMoran is the only one that I wouldn't be betting against. Just look at all of them. RSI is too high. I don't even know who that is. Oh, I do know who that is. No, look at all these. There's a lot of companies with neutrals or cells on the oscillator rating. What is the oscillator, oscillator rating again? Rates of change and whether or not they're turning over. So even though the technical rating and the moving average rating is still bullish in a lot of cases because that's short-term momentum, the oscillator rating is saying it's starting to turn over. It gives you four to eight weeks of, late, of lead time, usually. Four to eight weeks. So it's perfect for writing covered calls near the top, right? So when these turn from buy to neutral, great time to write a covered call. So if you own any of these, right, and this is how you use it. This is why I tell you just have trading view. Because I'm only talking about the punch card stocks. But if you own some of these other ones, right? Look at all these RSIs over 70 with the oscillator either neutral or already turned over. I think it's, it's pretty clear, right? So let's turn it over, though. What's undervalued. So this is one that I think you want to want to buy. So the technical rating and the moving average are both negative, but the oscillator is already turned positive. That means that you're probably roughly at a bottom. Maybe a little bit more momentum to the downside, but things are improving pretty quick. Prologis, I, I've been talking about REITs for a, a few weeks now. Uh, not on my list. I like Stag Industrial. You know, where else? Robert Half. I've traded that in the past. They don't have a moat, so I don't bother. And I don't know who that is. You know, I talked to Walgreens managers because I'm friends with a couple, and they seem to think things are getting better. So when the managers aren't disaffected and unhappy, that usually means things are getting better. So maybe I have to look back in the log. We'll see. I think they've done all the suffering they can do from the standpoint of the market indexes. So now it's just a question of, is the company going to see better revenues, and better margins. Maybe. More people taking pills. What else do we have here? Oh, Warner Brothers Discovery. They got to get bought, right? That's got to be around the corner. Not many. Not many buys right now. I don't like Crown Castle. I'd rather have American Tower. The only reason Crown Castle does well is because they're on the S&P 500. American Tower is a better company all day long, so I'll use them to get some international exposure. All right. Are there any trades that you want to see set up? 
covered calls that anybody has a question about. What do you own that you think might be a good one to write a covered call on? So, and I think this follows along with my thinking on Exxon. Go to June, probably the one to, to sell. What is, uh, we're at 53 right now. We want a covered call. And we saw that it was over overpriced or over uh, overbought. June 21st, say $55. Yeah, there you go. Buck 46. You sell a covered call now. If it goes over 55, it gets called away. If it doesn't, you probably got a rally later on, right? If, if you're okay owning it for the next two, three, four years, which I, I think there will be more rally in, in oil and gas, it's just it's, it's very up and down, right? Very choppy. So if you own Devon, I think, uh, yeah, I think the June 55 is probably a pretty good one for you. You may want to trim a couple shares if you're up. A couple people saying new months. I think that one's probably appropriate. So June 50s, probably June 45s, actually. So I'm not going to throw a chart up, but we looked at the chart the other day. So June 45, you get a buck 21 on uh, new months. I think that that's probably a pretty good one. And it probably gets called away. And again, I would write that before Jerome Powell talk. I, I really think Jerome Powell is going to be mean Jerome on Wednesday. He needs to get this correction out of the way so he can cut rates. But as I said in the article, about the uh, Fed stagflation problem, they might screw it up. You know, you all know that I was pretty skeptical of Jerome Powell when he got hired. I've become a fan. You do not want to write cover calls on Occidental. It was way undervalued to begin with. So don't bother. Just leave it alone. C-E-L-H. I don't even know what that is. What the hell is that? I don't know a lot about this company. What do they do? The beverage company? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what they are. Um, so if you use Monster as the example, which is the appropriate one to use, you can see, well, just crushes Monster lately. <laughs> when did you buy this? Oh, three years. It appears to be priced where it's supposed to be priced. Oh, wow. Right, right on the red line. Right on the red line. Right in the fair value gap. Elliott Wave kind of says, you know, about where it belongs. And it does say it's up here. So it's going to go here, bounce, and then drop again. More likely than not patterns. Well, the AI does not see another pattern. Right? Uh, I'd probably write a cover call here. $73 stock at 80 maybe. Get 560 or for six cents. Did I misspeak on something earlier? One moment, please. I, I don't know a lot about this one. So, I mean, I, I can't really tell you. It looks about fairly valued, though, just from the chart. Man, the 80 is uh, 575 that you would get. Yeah, I think probably this is the one. And again, if you own a bunch of it and you made a bunch of money, you, know, you might want to take a little bit of a capital gain here. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how much you own. GE Aerospace. Honestly, I would just sell GE Aerospace outright. See, this is a uh, look, the RSI is not horrible, but it really bounces all over the place. You could even wait a little bit to sell the cover call on Celsius. Flip over to GE. Yeah, one, two, boom, boom, probably. So a covered call, let it dip, let it expire. Let it run up and then do it again. That's the game plan for that one. I mean, look at the price. I just looked at the, the relative strength index. NS is, so do you own, you want that, right? Oh, okay. No, 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 no. Probably want that. You're already split. So that's 164. So on the 190, you get that. Probably go all the way 75. Yeah, I'd probably do that. Three bucks. All right. That's it. All right. But you see how I do that, right? I just look at the weekly RSI. And remember the, the, um, Three drive, right? It'll generally get overbought three times. Then again, over here. Then it's in trouble. Then it probably gets oversold three times, right? They come in cluster. This was just a crash. This was a step ladder down over a year and a half. And of course, you have to know something about the business. The problem with all the GE companies is that they're in heavy CapEx businesses. Now, GE Aerospace has a lot of long term growth, but it's lumpy. And if they try to broaden the scope of their business, they run into the you know problems with trying to grow a business. They are one of the only games in town, though. So I like them in general. I've always liked parts of that company. And now that they've broken it up, which is something I said to do. Man, I said that way back during the financial crisis, just break it up. You know, man, did I get called an idiot for that. And when I told people to short GE back in 2006 and seven, <laughs> I mean, I was just called an imbecile. Unfortunately, I'd have to find a, a, a very old chart. But, you know, I was telling people to short GE back in here. You know, it's a whole different company now. But I don't know. I, I feel like that was probably a pretty good call. 
it's in the same place as it was 20 over 20 years ago wild volatility though all right any puts to sell somebody mentioned spire global they just got a huge contract you, you do not want to sell any spire global still be a buyer of spire and a put seller i just be a buyer here it's it's they're going to get put onto the russell 2000 so you should be buying you should you should be filling up and, and this one's getting in we don't know about a metis yet this one's getting in i don't know how they wouldn't so they are plenty above the market cap threshold and they just got some big contract today so this is a company turning profitable it's got the right capitalization it's growing their capex is coming down I think this could be one of the darling stocks the next time that space is important to people. And, and, and for sure when Jerome Powell gets the green light to lower interest rates, which I think is coming by June or July. Uh, again, I would have done it already, but I understand why he's not. He's afraid that oil and housing are going to screw up inflation. So, But the thing is, is, you fix housing by having lower rates. Right? Prices go up, again, because people buy stupid but if more housing gets built, it at least fixes the supply-demand equation and it levels off over time. Now, I don't know how you get away from houses being too expensive through Fed policy, other than you have to encourage guys like me to build 40-unit buildings or 100-unit buildings. I wouldn't be selling puts on Intel. I'd probably just be buying it. I mean, if you don't own any, if you don't own any Intel, I guess do both. Some of these are just so beaten up. And if you do own it, I guess, if you do own it, sure, go ahead and sell it June. I probably sell it in the money. Sell it June for a buck thirty-nine. So you're basically making an extra dollar, a little bit less. June thirty-two is what I would sell. Right? Because take a look at the chart. It's pretty pretty oversold, right? And it's pretty much just about there. I mean, is there a little bit more downward momentum? I guess. I mean, if you're really worried about that, then I think you go all the way to thirty. Oh, that's a cover call. My my bad. Switch the switch the cash though. I think you go to 32, get a buck 79. You only get 88 cents on a 30. You got to decide how afraid you are of it going below 30. If it does, it's just for a hot minute. The article I'm going to write on Intel is buy Intel before the next government check, right? Step two, does it get government money? Yes, <laughs> lots. So buy Intel between before the next government check. And remember, they're online uh, beginning the end of this year and everything's up next. If you've been reading the, the business journal, and, and that's one of the other subscriptions that I think is fantastic. It's, it's one of the, I, I probably read that of any publication. I probably read the business journal second most after Bloomberg because I can gauge what's going on in cities across America. I get the national edition. I spend the extra hundred or 200 bucks, whatever it is. And the business journal is really pointing out how much construction is going on around the world. I just saw a chart. If I can find it again, I'll post it. That showed all the industrial real estate developments around the country in the past year. It's like $51 billion worth. Think about that. Talk about reshoring. If we ever get over immigration, you know, the issues in pretty good shape. So let's take a look at BMY. Somebody asked about Bristol Myers. Yeah. I mean, I, I just like buying it because it's got a big dividend. But can you sell a cash secured put? Yeah, for sure. 44. June 45, you get a buck 53 for it. That means you get a net cost of 43.50 if it's put to you. I think that's pretty good. Crystal Myers is a great company. Um, I think Pfizer has more upside, but uh, I think you can own both. These are the two individual names that I, I've been buying. That I just think the market hates them right now, and they're going to get into the same games everybody loves right now, right? They're going to get into weight loss, and they're going to get into more stuff, and AI is going to help them, and the mRNA platform at Pfizer is a big deal. So if AI gives them a, a dividend, you know, a, a benefit a year or two out, when does the market sniff that out? Now, it's already been talked about on Bloomberg. So the smart money already knows that AI is going to increase the margins at all the healthcare companies. So you got to buy the ones that are undervalued right now. And Pfizer and Bristol-Myers are the ones that are undervalued. So I like buying them both. If you want to sell a cash secure put, you can do that as well um, i wouldn't only sell the cash secured put i mean at least have a starter position to go along with it all right um i edited the video from saturday on sunday and i just haven't posted it yet so i'll put that up now i will try to get this edited and i will finish the stocks of the week here this afternoon all right have a good good day sorry for getting mad at you come on large caps rely on liquidity liquidity is a function of employment and central bank, lesser extent the federal government. All right.
have a, a 